Morning, church. Hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, it was so good to see so many family members here. And uh, one of the blessings, I think, of this time of year is the opportunity for family to get together. We're going to be doing something a little bit different in our adult Bible classes in December. Um, one of the elders is going to be teaching each of the, one, of the five classes through December. This morning, Chris Wilson is going to be teaching our combined adults in here. Um, he's going to be telling the story of Mephibosheth. And if you're not familiar with that Old Testament story, to me, it's one of the most beautiful stories in all of the Bible. And one of the most illustrative of God's grace. And I would sure encourage you to stay as Chris talks about the story of David and Mephibosheth. This morning, I want us to start uh, a couple of lessons looking at the parable of the two sons. Now, most of you, when you think about Luke 15, and you think about this parable, we'll speak in terms of the parable of the prodigal son. And it's not. It is, but it isn't. This is a parable in two parts, in, in two acts. And both of those acts are very significant. Both of them are very important. And I think it's unfortunate that we have focused on the story that involves the prodigal son and failed to focus all, as well on the rest of the story, which talks about the older brother. And so what I want us to do over the next couple of weeks is look at this parable in toto, because I believe very much that's how Jesus intended for us to see it and to hear it. It's important, first of all, to set the context for this parable. As we talked about when we talked about how to study the Bible, it's very important that you look at a passage in context. So very often that context can help you understand the force of the passage, uh, the point that the writer is trying to get across. And that's very, very true when it comes to the parable of the two sons. If you'll notice in verses 1 through 3 of Luke chapter 15, Luke introduces this collection of three parables. Remember, there's the parable of the shepherd and the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the two sons. But it's introduced in this way. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. And that's how he introduces the three parables. But I think it's very important that you understand the context in which this is placed. You have people whose lives are really messed up, okay? The publicans and the sinners. And they are flocking to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes who consider themselves righteous and a little bit better than everybody else are standing back looking down their nose at these people that are gathering with Jesus and grumbling and saying, what is this guy doing eating with these people? Now, in that context, the parable of the two sons could not be more applicable because this parable really is directed to, oftentimes I think we think this parable is directed to people who have stumbled and lost their way, the prodigal sons, and it is, and it is, but it is very much directed to these scribes and Pharisees. In fact, there's three important things that I want you to keep in mind as we study this, this parable. And so I want to put them up front and I want to talk a second about them because as we study through here, I want you to keep these frames of reference in mind. Number one, Jesus is speaking to a hostile, judgmental, self-righteous audience. These scribes and Pharisees. They're, again, they're looking down their nose at him because he is associating with people that they look down their nose at all the time in these publicans and sinners. And so this parable is addressed to these people. Secondly, the father is the pivotal character in this parable. 
This is about the two sons' relationship with and reaction to their father and his reaction to them. This is not just about the prodigal son messing up. This is very much, very much about the dad, about the father. He is the character that appears in both acts of this parable. And ultimately, it's his reaction and the way that he handles these situations that, as much as anything, is what we're to pay attention to and listen to. And thirdly, both sons are lost to their father. Both of them are lost, brothers and sisters. It's not just the prodigal son who's lost. It's the older son who's lost as well. Now, they're lost for very different reasons. And in the next lesson, I want us to talk about those reasons. But really, the story of the first son, the one we call the prodigal son, is told as much as anything to set you up for the reaction of the second son. And the second part, again, of this parable is every bit as relevant and important as the first part of this parable is. And so please keep these three things in mind as we read the parable of the two sons and begin to talk about it. Now, um, you can follow me on the screen, you can follow along in your Bible, but I wanna read now the story of these two sons and just listen as Jesus describes these two different scenarios and the father's reaction to them. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And as he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer to be worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now, his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother's come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry, refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you're always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and, and is alive. He was lost and is found. Now, I want to take us back to the beginning of this parable. And this morning, I want us to focus um, on the story of what we call the prodigal son. And then in the next lesson, I want us to look at that older brother and I want us to look at what drives both of them. Now, it begins, notice, there was a man who had how many sons? 
Two, he didn't want you to just pay attention to the prodigal son. He wants you to pay attention to the older son. He starts right off by telling you there's two boys here that he's going to be talking about, not just one. Now, the younger of them comes to him and says, Dad, I want you to give me the share of property that is coming to me. Now, you got to understand something. And I don't think a lot of times we understand the force of what's going on here, the ugliness of what's occurring. When you go back into the Old Testament law, you look at passages like Deuteronomy 21, 17, where it talks about the division of property. The oldest son is always to get a double share and the other sons get the rest. And so in essence, what he's saying is, Dad, I want you to divide the property up three ways. I want my third and I want it right now. Here's the thing. You divide the property up when the property owner's dead. Not while the property owner's alive. What this boy is saying to his father is, I consider you as dead. I want you to act as though you're gone. I don't want to wait for you to die. I want what I want right now. He could not be, understand, he could not be more disrespectful toward his father, more unloving, more cutting, more cruel than what he is. This kid has a real chip on his shoulder. And he is deeply wounding his father when he does this. Now his dad's response is interesting. And I want you to note it. Because his dad would have every right under the circumstances to boot his son out, to disown him, to run him off, to say, I want nothing to do with you. How dare you treat me like that? Because in that culture at that time, he would have had every right to do that. And you got to understand, there are people, I guarantee as Jesus is telling us, or are looking at each other going, whoa. But what's the father do? The text says he divided his property between them. He doesn't disown his son, doesn't literally slap him up the side of the head, which in that culture he could have. Instead, he acquiesces. Fine. If you want to treat me as though I were dead, if you want to sever your relationship with me, okay. Now understand, what this means is that he's probably going to have to dispose of at least a third of his property. Now he's not dead yet. And he is going to sell a third of what he has to give to this son. Because the other two thirds will go to the older brother. But I believe one of the reasons the older brother is hacked like he is and reacts like he does is because in essence, he has had a third of that piece of property that could increase in value, could be worth more when the father does die, taken away. In fact, you can't pick this up in English, but literally what it says here is he divided his life between them. Now here in many parts of the world, men are born and raised and die on the same piece of property, don't they? And they give their lives to that piece of property. And they pass that piece of property on to their children, who pass it on to their children, who pass it on to their children. That property is a part of who they are. It is their life. This young man is saying to his dad, I want you to sell a part of your life and give it to me. I want to treat you as though you were dead. And the dad does it. I want to ask you something. What does that say about God's relationship with you. What does that say about when you want to sever that relationship? When people choose to walk away, and they do, 
What's it say? He says, I am not going to force you to be with me. I'm not going to force you to stay in relationship with me. I want you to be with me because you want to be with me. And if you want to go off into a far country, I will let you go off into a far country. Now I'm going to keep on loving you. Dad keeps on loving him. But dad is not going to make us stay with him. We're going to be with him because he wants us. We want to be with him. And so he divides his property. The young man, notice, gathered all he had, verse 15, and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. You know, I think it's almost inevitable that what Jesus speaks of here happens. That is, that he leaves and goes off into a far country. When you choose to sever your relationship with the Father, how often do you want anything to do with him or his family? I've seen it over and over again. When people walk away from God, they walk away from the church. When people walk away from God, they not only walk away from him, they walk away from his children because now they're uncomfortable with them. Now there's, there's a tension there that wasn't there before. And so they'll leave and they will go off into a far country. They'll form different relationships because they've turned their back on one of the most significant, the most significant relationship in their life, their relationship with their father. And they go off to a far country. They leave because they are no longer comfortable with where they've been. And that's exactly what this kid does. Now he goes off into the far country, he spends everything, okay, blows his money. How often have we seen that happen too in people's lives? They're blessed and they blow it. And when he comes to his senses, he hires himself out to one of the citizens of the country who sent him in his field to feed pigs. Now, if you're a Jew, is there a worse job in the world than to feed pigs? That's just about the lowest of the low. You just can't get any lower than that. Caring for an unclean animal. And that's what he's left to. And why does he have to resort to that? Here's another lesson for you. Because all those partying buddies who were sure glad to be his friend while he was spending the money, have done what? They're gone, aren't they? They've disappeared. Welcome to the world's version of friendship. I'm glad to be your buddy, man. I'm glad to be with you. I'm glad to enjoy. As long as you're spending money, I'm glad to be there. And the second you run out, I am gone. And that is exactly what happens here? And he finds himself off in a far country by himself, starving to death, feeding pigs. As the text goes on to say, he was longing to be fed with the pods the pigs ate. He's so hungry, he did anything, and no one gave him anything. Now, verse 17, we've talked a lot about through the years, and you see emphasized a lot. And he came to himself. He came to his senses. He woke up. Isn't it a shame that so very often people have to go off into a far country and they have to wake up in a pig pen before one day they go, oh, why am I here? What was I thinking? What have I done? There's a very real sense in which going off into sin is going off into insanity. It is. Living in sin is insane. It makes no sense. It destroys you, destroys everybody around you. Look at what sin does. Look at the wreck it makes of people's lives. Look at the harm that it does. To give yourself over to sin is to give yourself over to craziness. It really is. 
It's, it's, it's living a life that really doesn't make any sense in multiple ways. But in that pig pen at some point, he comes to his senses. And notice what he says to himself. Man, you know, those hired servants back home had enough food to eat. I'm dying of hunger here. I will arise and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. You know what just happened? Right there is a perfect illustration of repentance. To repent is to change your mind, isn't it? It is to change how you think, how you look at life. How has he been looking at life? I guarantee you, who's it been all about? It's been all about him. Did he care about anybody else but him? Did he live for anybody else but him? Did he think about the implications of what he was doing on his dad? Did he think about the implications of what he was doing on his older brother? Did he think about the implications in so many ways? No, because it was all about him and him having a good time. Now, all of a sudden he's changed how he's thinking. He's changed his focus, hadn't he? He's repented. And I can just, and you can too, I can just imagine him figuring out how am I going to word this? What am I going to say to my dad? And what are you going to say to him? You've broken his heart. You've, in a very real sense, spit on him. You have treated him horribly. What, what, am, I, what am I going to say to this man that I have publicly humiliated because he did. He publicly humiliated his dad by treating him like he did. What am I going to say to him? Somehow, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you sounds inadequate. And so he goes on to say, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now there is the root of the apology. I was your son. I rejected you. I walked away from you. I'm not worthy now to call you father. I have no right to ask you to call me son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. I am not coming home asking to be accepted back by you. I've hurt you too deeply. I'm coming home. Hired servants were day workers. These aren't slaves, these are day workers. And basically what he's saying is, Dad, let me come home and treat me like a day worker. Would you do that, please? I'm not asking you to treat me like a son. I'm just asking, me you, to treat, asking you to treat me like you would treat other people who work for you. And he goes home. Now here, of course, is the response of the dad. While he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Dad let him go. Dad is waiting for him to come home. Wanting him to come home. And the son said to him, he's rehearsed it, hadn't he? How many times has he repeated this line? in the days it took him to get home. Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And his dad interrupts him, verse 22. But his father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And you know what the best robe is? It's the father's robe. Father's got the best robe. The father's saying, take my robe, take my robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let's eat and celebrate. Verse 24. For this my son was dead.
Now he was dead to the Father because he had separated himself from the Father. And it's important to understand, folks, he's dead to the village. And he's still dead to the village. Because in the Jewish culture, when you pulled something like this, you, you turned your back like he turned his back on his father and on his faith. You were dead to the whole village. As far as they were concerned, when this kid took off after he had done what he was done, he was dead. They would have nothing to do with him. You see intimations of this in the gospel at times. Okay. When, for instance, in John 9, the blind man's parents, basically they threatened to cast them out. Horrific implications to that. What's the father saying? Oh no. He's alive again. And he's not going to have to pay penance. He's not going to have to work his way back into good graces. It's my gift to him. He was lost and is found. And they begin to celebrate. Brethren, there's grace. There's how the Father sees you and sees me. And if it nearly brings tears to your eyes, I think it ought to nearly bring tears to your eyes. It doesn't. Because what's it saying? Jesus is saying, you can turn your back on the Father, you can humiliate the Father. You can break His heart. You can walk away from Him, you can make a mess, and He'll welcome you home. He'll welcome you home. And he'll put his robe on your back. He'll put his ring on your finger. He'll have shoes put on your feet. And he'll throw a feast. Because he's just glad you came home. And he wants you to be with him. And that's why this part of the story touches hearts like it does. But I want you to understand the story's not over. And in the next lesson, we'll look at the rest of the story. But hold on to this part because it is so important. And when we feel like there's no way God would accept me back, I would encourage you to think about the prodigal son and think about a love that really is amazing. A love that is awesome. A love that reaches beyond comprehension. A love that we celebrate like we did a few minutes ago when we eat the Lord's Supper. Because there is a true reflection of the depth of that love. If you're ready to respond to it this morning in any way, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?